you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear two students talking about libraries. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi there, Tim. You look tired. Hi, Zara. I am tired. Well, it is SWATVAC after all. SWATVAC? Ah, yes, of course. Exam period. <laughs> Don't remind me. I'm pretty exhausted myself. I'm finding it very difficult to study. It's so noisy where I live. I can't concentrate with all that traffic outside. I definitely need to find a quieter place to study. Me too. Actually, I've just downloaded some information about the best libraries in the city. Take a look at this. It's the Bailey Library. The Bailey Library? Isn't that the really old library on Parkville campus? Yeah, that's the one. It's the oldest in the city. And it says here that it's really popular with students. Popular with students? That means it's noisy and crowded. <laughs> OK, OK. I see what you mean. But we could try to get there early to make sure we get good seats and a large desk to work at. It's open from half past eight in the morning until ten o'clock in the evening, Mondays to Fridays. Ten. That's very early. I study much better after midnight. Just look at the size of my folder here. I've got so much to get through. Basically, I need to be in the library 24-7 to get all my revision done. Now, if the Bailey is that popular, it must be open at weekends. Yes, of course it is. It opens at 11 o'clock, in fact, and it closes at 5 p.m. Great. Not exactly what I call ideal for late-night study. Count me out. OK, OK. Here's another one. The Brown Library. Oh, uh, yeah. I think I've gone past it a couple of times. It's close to Stratton Street, right? Yes, Stratton Street and Royal Parade. Royal Parade? Well, that's convenient for me. My apartment's just a few minutes' walk from there. When's it open? Well, it says here it opens at 7 in the morning, and you'll be pleased to hear that it closes well after midnight, 2 a.m. in fact. And we can go there any day of the week. That sounds ideal. Oh, wait a minute. We can't use it. It's only open to biomedical students. Biomedical students only? Great. Just when we thought we'd found the perfect place to study. Mm. Oh, wait a minute. This one sounds good. The RMIT Library. The RMIT Library? I've never heard of it. Where is it? It's on Swan Street, near the Central Bus Station. Swan Street. Ah, oh, yes, I know where that is. It's a really long street, though. Do you have a number? Yes, number 360, Swan Street. The full address is Level 5, Building 8, 360, Swan Street. OK. I think we'd need to get the bus there, but that's not a problem. So when's it open? It's open from 10 till midnight on weekdays. And what about weekends? Uh, 10 in the morning, but it closes at 6 o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays. But listen, it says here it has excellent computer and internet facilities. I like the sound of that. 
Me too. In fact, I like the sound of it so much, I think I'll take advantage of their excellent computer facilities right here and now. And how exactly are you going to do that? Your laptop isn't working. I know, I know. So can I borrow yours? Now you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, here's the RMIT library website. So we want the bookings page. OK, first of all, you need to log on to Book It. Book It? Yeah, that's it, Book It. OK. Now it's asking me for my student ID and my password. OK, so just type in your student number. I think I can just about remember it. And now your password. OK. So next, you need to choose the resource type you want to book. That's easy. A PC. So now what you need to do is click on Location. Location. OK. Now it's giving me a floor plan. It looks like I've got a choice of 18 computers. Great. So click on one of the PCs. I'm choosing this one. It's right next to the window. PC number four, to be exact. So what do I do now? So now you have to choose the date of booking. So when do you want to book it for? Let's go for tomorrow. That's Friday, June 6th. And just click. I just have. So why isn't it working? Uh, you've got to go into View Options. Ah, it's working now. Friday, June 6th. OK, so now you need to choose a time. Let's go for a late afternoon, 5 p.m. Right, let's do it. Great. It says Booking Completed, and there's my name on the booking schedule. Result. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. You will hear a guide talking about a tourist program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to all of you. Can everyone see me and hear me? Good. My name's Cathy and I'm here to tell you about the special programme of events going on here at the Royal Observatory. Yes, it's Doors Open Day here in Edinburgh. And we're delighted that you have chosen to make this very special building part of your own Open Doors Day experience. Now, I'll make a start with giving you some background information about the Doors Open event. 
Doors Open takes place every year in September, and the observatory is one of the many buildings, 112 of them in fact, that open their doors to visitors for one weekend. And yes, there's absolutely no charge. It's all completely free. The observatory has been involved in this event for more than 20 years, and every year we attract more and more visitors, like you, who want to find out more about great buildings in the city. And hopefully, you'll leave with a better understanding of the universe too. OK, now let's run through today's programme of events. There are many activities to choose from, so make sure you make the most of your visit. Now, there will be planetarium shows throughout the day. Now, these will run four times, both today and tomorrow, Sunday. These are popular, so please note that we're operating a booking system for these shows. Tickets for the two shows we're running this morning, the first showing at 10.30 and the second at 11.30, will be available on a first-come, first-served basis, here at the information point. Tickets for the two afternoon shows at 2pm and then at 3pm will be released later on at midday. So booking is essential as spaces go very quickly. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. We also have some special tours of the observatory available. These include a tour of the telescope dome and visitors will even have the opportunity to get onto the roof. I hope that those of you who are interested are wearing your most comfortable shoes and that you can keep up the pace. It will be worth the effort of climbing all these stairs. You'll have stunning views over the city when you reach the top. Now, for those of you who want to take things at a more leisurely pace, there will be an opportunity to visit the Crawford Collection and learn about the instruments that have been built here and there will also be some items from the collection on view. For those of you who don't already know, the Crawford Collection is an astronomical library. And not only that, it ranks as one of the most important astronomical libraries in the world. You are promised a real treat here. And it's great to have so many younger visitors here today. Now, we have a craft workshop for children here in the visitor centre where they can make their very own model of a telescope and colour their very own planet. Please note that all children must be accompanied by an adult. So. As you can see, it's a pretty full timetable and there's a lot going on. Now, any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. You will hear three students discussing the issue of waste deposited in space. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23.
Listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 23. Hey, did you manage to go to the talk by Dr Chadwick this morning, Andy? I was there. What happened to you, Sam? My bike had a puncture. Mm. Seriously. Anyway, Ruth, I bet you took some notes. Can you fill me in? Sure. It was all about space junk. Really interesting, actually. I mean, I knew about how much rubbish humans are dumping here on planet Earth, but I had no idea how much junk there is flying around in space. Did you know that there are literally millions of pieces of rubbish orbiting the Earth as we speak? Not until now, I didn't. <laughs> they reckon that around a hundred tons of very small objects, like mainly dust, drops on Earth every single day. Yes, that's what she said. I thought space junk was all man-made. I can't believe they know so accurately how much is actually out there. Do they track and monitor it all the time? Yeah, they do. According to the talk, there are nearly 25,000 objects, larger than 10 centimetres in diameter, now orbiting the Earth. And what does all this space junk consist of? Isn't it all discarded parts of rockets that were either broken or left behind after space missions, like Apollo and all those spacecraft from years ago? Well, yes, but not only that. All other kinds of debris that we've dumped in space too. Anything from... Dead satellites to loose metal screws. There are even tiny particles of paint and liquid coolant. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 26. Now listen to the next part of the discussion and answer questions 24 to 26. So who is to blame for depositing all this rubbish? Where does it come from? Well, I knew you were going to ask me that, Sam. So, hang on. You can take some of my notes if you like. Thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Here, look. Over a third, 37% to be exact, comes from Russia. But other countries are close behind. Another third, well, just under actually, 29% is from America, and then 28% is from China. Yes, but other countries, like India, are adding to the rubbish pile. And don't forget the European Space Agency also has spacecraft in orbit. That's true. We're talking serious space junk here. Mm, pretty serious, I'd say. So come on. What do you think are the chances of something solid dropping from space onto our heads? <laughs> Good question. Everyone asked that. Dr Chadwick said at least one piece of junk falls to Earth every single day. But look at it this way. Earth is a pretty big place, so actually the statistical chances of being hit are extremely low. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. So are you saying I'm more likely to win the lottery? Well, just <laughs> think about it. Two-thirds of the Earth is ocean. <laughs> That's true. But in time, almost all these pieces of rubbish will fall to Earth because the object's orbit is decreased by its gravitational pull. But the good news is that they don't cause any serious damage. You know, they can't actually survive the heat generated on re-entry. They simply burn away. But that's not always the case. There are exceptions. Chunks of the United States UARS satellite recently fell into the Pacific Ocean. The UARS satellite? It was this six-ton satellite launched by the Space Shuttle Discovery way back in 1991. 
so it had been up in space for 20 years but stopped working in 2005. It weighed 5,700 kilos. And that's about the same as a double-decker bus, apparently. And, just check my notes, here it is, yes. The largest of these great big chunks that fell into the sea weighed about 158 kilograms. Think of the weight of an adult gorilla, Sam, and you get the picture. A nice soft landing, then. <laughs> <laughs> Dr Chadwick said, imagine a couple of washing machines tied together and travelling at 100 miles per hour, and you'll get an idea. <laughs> oh, and do you remember Skylab? That was another US space station, and it fell to Earth at least three decades ago, in 1979. It fell into the Indian Ocean and the deserts of Western Australia. According to what I wrote down, that particular space junk weighed 100 tonnes. And let's not forget Mir. The Russian space station. Mir weighed 135 tonnes, far, far larger than UARS, and it fell to Earth in 2001. It plunged straight into the South Pacific. All very interesting. Listen, I've got some junk of my own to sort out. My bike. That's the second puncture this week. <laughs> Come on, I'll help you fix it. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. You will hear a woman talking about retail psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. Let's get started on the final lecture in our module on retail psychology. Today we're going to focus on supermarket layouts and how retailers display their products to encourage us as customers to spend as much of our money as possible. It's an interesting topic. Now, most of us don't actually realize that the layout is deliberately designed to make us part with our money. But in fact, millions of pounds are spent on research into the psychology of shoppers and what motivates us to buy. So, Let's have a look at an actual supermarket layout. Now, here's the entrance to the store, just here. This area immediately around the entrance is what retailers refer to as the decompression zone or the dead zone. This is where the customers recover from the environment outside and by that I mean this is where they adjust. For example, the place where they might put their keys in their pockets or take off their sunglasses. 
these kinds of things. So, what do you notice about this area? It's very empty, isn't it? Yes, it's pretty much clear of stock altogether. This area is not designed or used to sell us anything. Basically, the supermarkets never put any merchandise here because they know that no one's ready to buy yet. However, the retailers want their customers to feel comfortable. If they're in a relaxed state of mind, they're much more likely to stay longer and spend money. Now let's look back at the entrance again. Now it's interesting, but we know that three quarters of us look right, not left, when we go into a supermarket. So seventy-five percent of people. This gives the supermarkets a great opportunity to hit us with promotions and offers. So near the front door, you might also find what we call the dwell zone. The dwell zone. Is the area on the right-hand side by the front door, where you are encouraged to relax and browse. You will usually find newspapers and flowers here to help you do exactly that. Moving on from the dwell zone, we come to the power aisle. Basically, it's the main route customers return to after venturing into nearby aisles. And so this is the area of the supermarket where the strongest offers are displayed. So you might see a sign that reads "Barbecue Time," and you'll see all the items you could possibly need for a barbecue: the charcoal, the sauces, the skewers, and the drinks. Everything you need, all in one place. Were you planning a barbecue before you went shopping? Do you even have a garden? <laughs> yes, the power aisle has a very powerful effect on sales, even though most of us don't even realize we are being sold to here. Now let's think about fruit and vegetables for a moment. They're always located towards the front. Now, why do you think this is? Yes, fruit and vegetables are always at the front because it gives the supermarket a healthy image. And let's think back to flowers and newspapers. We talked about both these items earlier, and yes, they're displayed near the front on the right. Now they're known as distress goods. Why is that? Well. These are the goods that we often buy in a hurry or on impulse. In other words, these are the items we didn't actually intend to buy at all, but the supermarkets want us to put them in our trolleys even before we start our proper shopping. Now, what about everyday items like bread or milk or cereals? They're always placed right at the back of the supermarket. Yes, in this area here. Again, this is a deliberate strategy by the supermarkets. Basically, they want us to walk through the whole store to get them, in the hope we will buy other things on the way. That's why items like these are often called destination goods. Now, where products are placed on the shelves makes a real difference. We read shelves a bit like we read a book. Our eyes go from left to right, and they want you to focus on the more expensive items, so they place them at eye level. It's often quite hard to spot items like cheap tinned food. Why is that? Well. They're normally placed very low on the shelves. Basically, the supermarkets don't want the cheapest products to be the ones you see first. Finally, let's have a look at the checkout area here. Now, we all know that sweets are deliberately placed within the reach of children at the checkout, but all kinds of things are displayed at checkouts these days. In fact, supermarkets can change what's on offer almost by the hour. 
it's a quick and easy way for them to rotate their stock. So, if the sun comes out, the checkout is an ideal place to display sunglasses. And if it rains, umbrellas can be placed there instead. Now, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.